Okay, everyone, we will go ahead and get started. Um, people will probably continue to log in as we get started, uh, but we will go ahead. We have an hour, so I wanna to get to some of our stuff pretty quickly. We have a lot to talk about. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Courtney Joslin, um, and I am a resident fellow in commercial freedom at the R Street Institute. Uh, for those of you who might be unfamiliar with R Street, uh, we are a nonpartisan public policy research organization based in DC. And our motto is free markets, real solutions. One of our research areas, uh, which is what brings us here today is on expanding birth control access through state level reforms. Um, some of these reforms are a somewhat less traditional way of thinking about birth control access, but they're increasing in popularity uh, because of their success. More commonly, we hear of birth control access in terms of the cost of the prescription itself, as well as federal efforts to make birth control pills available over the counter. But any healthcare type reform these days has to consider the larger context. So getting a prescription, not just for birth control, means finding a doctor, obtaining appointments, and only then can we go to the pharmacy to pick up a prescription. This entire process is costly, both in actual dollars and in time spent. The cost of this process and the availability of doctor's appointments in the first place are pretty consistently on Americans' minds these days. Last year, a Gallup poll found that over 90% of Americans were at least somewhat worried about finding both affordable and accessible healthcare. Over half of Americans were very worried about this. So one way states have begun to address this issue is through pharmacist prescribing. In terms of birth control, 16 states plus Washington DC now allow people to go directly to a pharmacist and have an evaluation for a birth control prescription. Pharmacists and pharmacies are more accessible in many communities across the country. Uh, pharmacies usually have longer hours as well, meaning someone in need of a birth control prescription can go after work instead of needing to take time off for a visit for a traditional nine to five doctor's office. The evidence on pharmacists prescribed birth control is emerging as well. Uh, pharmacists written prescriptions for birth control are associated with fewer unintended pregnancies, lower health care costs for public health insurance programs, and they're also reaching younger uninsured women. Pharmacists also often dispense more months worth of birth control at a time, saving patients the time and cost of having to renew a prescription every three months in many cases. All of this reduces the overall cost to people to get birth control uh, from a trusted medical professional and thankfully, it's sometimes a bipartisan state effort to get legislation across the finish line. That brings me to our guest with us, Wisconsin State Representative Joel Kitchens. Representative Kitchens is a Republican member of the Wisconsin Assembly and has held office since 2015. He focuses on economic, environmental, and education issues, and he is a doctor of veterinary medicine. In 2019, he introduced a pharmacy access bill that would allow pharmacists to prescribe birth control to Wisconsin women 18 years or older. The bill held numerous sponsors and while not across the finish line yet, made progress in the 2019 session. So welcome Representative Kitchens, we're very excited to have you. Well, thank you, great so, to be here. So we'll just jump into a few questions and have a discussion kind of your experience um, with this bill, what got you into it and that sort of thing. So. As a legislator, I mean, you have so many different public policy priorities to juggle when you're in session. So after you learned about the pharmacist prescribing model for birth control, why did you decide this was an issue that you wanted to champion and make a priority in Wisconsin? Well, after I started looking at it and I, I first heard about the model, the, the more I looked at it, it just, the more it made, made sense. You know, so many of the issues that we deal with are, are much more complicated than the general public would think. You know, there's always a, a plus side and a minus side. This one just seemed like such a no brainer the more I looked into it. Um, you know, I've had a lot of experience in education and I'm the vice, vice chairman of the education committee. Um, and I think part of it for me too was, I see the major obstacle that we have in education is sort of the, the generational poverty. And, um, you know, I, I think that one of the, the primary drivers of that really is unwanted pregnancy. And I, I really think the more you look into the, the finances of it and just the human aspect of it, it just makes all the sense in the world. And there really is just no medical reason for it not to be really over the counter, but at least, at least to, you know, through a pharmacy. 
Yeah, and that that's something that I think a lot of people, hopefully on the call, also realize is sort of that overarching uh, aspect that birth control plays in people's lives, right? It plays a huge role in timing the family planning, um, in reaching their career goals, in reaching you know their financial goals, and all of that. So it's such a an a integral part of people's lives. Um, so a common thread in a lot of our streets work um, is that we work on finding solutions that actually make sense. Uh, we don't seek out public policy solutions because they follow a party line or because they appease everyone that we work with. Instead, we believe that free markets and limited but effective government guide us to the best solutions. Uh, because of those principles, we are often considered a right of center organization, which we are. Um, so people are often surprised to learn that one of our program areas is on expanding birth control access, even though the issue fits within the principles of free markets and limited government. So, for example, opening up the market for birth control um, to include prescribing pharmacists means more consumers can access these products. Um, it also means that limiting government and in, how, in saying how you can live your life uh, is another conservative principle that many of us adhere to. Um, so you're a Republican sponsoring this bill, and I'm imagining that it's a lot of for some of these same reasons that I just mentioned. Several other states have Republican champions of pharmacy access bills as well, um, or bipartisan support from Republican uh, members in state houses as well. So as a Republican, how do you think this kind of healthcare reform fits within Republican priorities, whether it's, you know, in the last year or moving forward? How do you see that fitting within Republican priorities? And is there any sort of advantage for conservative lawmakers who might want to support these type of efforts coming uh, going forward? Sure. Um, you know, for, first off, from a policy standpoint, as I said, I think it makes all the sense in the world. But really, politically, it also makes sense. And when I first went to some of my colleagues, my Republican colleagues, and, and began to talk to them about this, at first, they were pretty reluctant. It's like, whoa, this isn't our area. You know, uh, but I, I think the more I talked about it, and the more they understood that it, it, this totally should be a Republican um, uh, thing that we should be going after. I, you know, I think from, a, as you said, from a free market standpoint, and I really think that the future of the Republican Party has to be more libertarian. I think that's what brings, that's what appeals to young people about our party. And from that standpoint, again, there, you know, we, we have the government putting obstacles in front of people and in front of businesses that with absolutely no reason. So I 100%, I think that it, that it fits within the Republican agenda. Um, from a political standpoint, obviously we get labeled a lot as not, you know, caring about women. We're the party of old men, old white men, you know. So um, I think it's an opportunity for us to to demonstrate that that we do care about those things. We understand everyday life. A funny thing was that when when I started working on this and the leadership of my party in the assembly, the speaker was a strong supporter once he sort of understood it as well. And but, but we did have a, a fair number of people that were very, very strong social conservatives that really had an issue with it, you know, so, so that was a battle. But he did some polling around, or they did some polling around the state with a multitude of issues going into the election about, you know, just to let us know how people felt about all the different issues. Of all the things that they, they polled on, this one was the number one most popular. It was 80% of people supported it. And so, you know, especially in this last election with Republicans struggling so much with suburban women, this is just an issue that appeals, you know, very strongly to them. And it seems to me, just looking through some of the polling as well, that, you know, Republicans have a hard time with suburban women, as you mentioned. Um, and as I was mentioning at the top too, healthcare remains an issue that's on the top of the list for Americans' concerns. And so this sort of proposal, which is, as I mentioned too, a little bit more innovative. I think people don't traditionally think of healthcare reform as opening up other healthcare professionals to certain uh, prescribing duties or you know, even extending uh, prescription limits, for example. So during the pandemic, when it first hit, a lot of state governors started issuing executive orders, allowing pharmacists to um, extend prescription refills, right? So that people who were about to run out of a prescription didn't have to go to a doctor during the height of the pandemic um, and could instead just go back to a pharmacist and get that prescription extended. So we're seeing sort of these like on the margin reforms is what I call them, where it's not this massive overhaul of a system, rather it's it's expanding into already existing systems and allowing for more of that. Do you see 
more of a role for, let's say, pharmacists or even nurse practitioners, perhaps, or registered nurses in some of these um, healthcare access issues, such as vaccinations is a big one now, obviously birth controls we're talking about. Do you see more of that kind of reform coming forward, or is that, is that on uh, lawmakers' radar at all right now? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, especially, you know, an awful lot of Wisconsin is, is rural and, and healthcare access is very limited. So, you know, I think we're seeing more and more of that about, you know, empowering nurse practitioners and, and others, even in the, in the dental field um, that, that can deliver these. And we're seeing a lot more telehealth. So, you know, these are all things that, that play a role in that, that you don't necessarily have to see an MD for all of these, these minor problems. And, and, and again, certainly in this situation in this thing that we're talking about um it's just it's just totally unnecessary so and the more we can free them up you know the 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 more that they can work on on the bigger the bigger issues i think um in rural wisconsin i mean we have we have counties that don't have a, an OBGYN. so um, um access to birth control is a really big deal and it and it's certainly the effectiveness of birth control is you know one of the, the major obstacles is access to it and if if women can't get in to see their their uh family practitioner or their OBGYN, that obviously that affects how well it works and that's something that we'll touch on in a little bit more with the pandemic but that's another thing that um, has occurred to us on the R Street side is that, you know, the closing doctor's offices and social distancing and stuff has contributed to this, uh, this um, inability to access healthcare. And so one of the things that's really important is um, I also read that the pandemic is causing a lot of women to put a hold on some of their family planning goals, which makes a lot of sense, right? Anytime there's massive financial instability in the country, a lot of women will sort of hold off on having children and that sort of thing. So we kind of have this weird problem where you have on one hand, uh, people advocating for better access and uh, uh, sort of exposing the problems as they are now. But then on the other hand, you have women who want maybe more birth control right now. So that way they're able to hold off on some of their plans. So I, I think from our end, we are seeing a little bit more uh, enthusiasm for some of these um, some of these reforms going forward. But I'm curious what you think is is this temporary? Are we going to see lawmakers sort of concerned about these issues around the pandemic and telehealth, as you mentioned, or allowing pharmacists to prescribe? Do you think this is sort of a temporary thing, or do you think there actually is uh, momentum gaining on some of these issues and it'll stick around for a little while? You know, I think that there was momentum anyway. I think, you know, we were working on a number of these um, initiatives prior to the pandemic. I think the pandemic has certainly you know, made it more clear that, that these things are, are necessary. So, you know, I, obviously the pandemic has been horrible, but I think that there are going to be some good things that come out of it. And I, I would hope that this will give it, you know, it, it added momentum. Same with like rural broadband that, you know, we knew it was important, but then you have the pandemic and kids can't get to school and you really realize, you know, how important it is. I also think with the pandemic, you know, we've seen in a lot of areas of healthcare, there've been some, you know, really bad, side effects to the pandemic beyond COVID itself. You know, we've seen that in areas that are heavily affected, more people die of heart attacks because they, they, they have chest pains and they put off going to see the doctor. We, you know, see increased, we're seeing increased um, cancer, the, the seriousness of, 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 of those uh, ailments when people have put off going to, they're going through the normal screenings or going to see the doctor when they have minor concerns. So, um, and this is just another one of those areas that I, I'm, I have no doubt that, you know, women have not gotten their prescriptions and that kind of thing because of the pandemic. Yeah, that's certainly true. Um, and so, you know, as a legislator, you've obviously been dealing in the Wisconsin Assembly with this issue and sort of learning, you know, the ins and outs of who's supporting this, who may oppose it. And the whole idea for this event came about after uh, a paper I wrote called Lessons for Legislators, a Guide to Allowing Pharmacists to Prescribe Birth Control. Um, and in the paper, I go through sort of the ins and outs of what good and bad pharmacy legislation looks like. Uh, and the goal of that was kind of to distill everything that we've learned um, from talking with state lawmakers, talking with different state-based associations and medical groups, um, 
about what makes a good or bad bill, what's actually going to expand access. Um, and we wanted to make it readable for public policy reformers because that's also important, right? You guys have limited time. You don't have time to read something that's like 20 pages long every day. Um, and so, but I work for a think tank. So I'm not in a state house actually working on these bills. So to that, if you were to talk to other state legislators who are thinking about some of these healthcare reforms like pharmacy access, who you know may have not heard of this type of reform before, but are interested in in sort of going about that, do you have any uh, you know sort of lessons learned that you would offer? Any surprising setbacks you had, or just anything you think helps get the ball rolling on this type of issue? Even when it comes to messaging, that's a big one too. So I'm curious to hear what lessons you might have for other legislators. Yeah, you know, I think that there's a lot of really good information, and and our street has put out a number of articles, you know, on the on the issue. I, I truly believe it's an issue that, uh, you know, aside from those people that are just strongly morally opposed to birth control, um, anyone that reads the facts on this will will get it, and and it is hugely important when you look at all the ramifications of unplanned pregnancy. Um, NCSL, the National Council of State Legislators. Um, I remember the acronym, but they uh, they had done an article when I was first looking at it too, just on the the costs of unplanned pregnancies. And in Wisconsin, um, it's it's two hundred and eighty six dollars per woman in Wisconsin every year, just covering the OB costs and the delivery of you know of unplanned pregnancies. And then you look at all the the dominoes that fall when that happens. That you know another figure I saw that um, you know community colleges tend to be first generation college students, right? So. 10% of the women that enroll in, in community colleges end up dropping out because of unplanned pregnancy. And then you think of that, these women rarely will go back and get their degree and what that means to their, you know, lifetime earning potential or their potential to be on, you know, on welfare. Um, you, you look at all of these things, it, it just, I, I think that if you can have those discussions and get people to actually listen to them, it's, it's really a pretty easy sell. Um, you know, I think Wisconsin is a really strange state that in that we're a very, very purple state. We're pretty much 50-50, but yet the politicians on both ends are very extreme. We don't have a lot of moderates. I'm, I'm pretty moderate, but we don't have a lot of those. Um, you know, our two US senators, Tammy Baldwin and Ron Johnson. We, we, Tammy Baldwin would be one of the 10 most liberal senators and Ron Johnson would be ten, one of the 10 most conservative. So it's just, that's the kind of state that we are. So it was difficult in Wisconsin because we do have some very, very strongly uh, socially conservative members. And, you know, it was really tough getting it past them. And we did get it passed in the assembly just barely um, because we have to get it past those people. But unfortunately, when the pandemic hit, the Senate ended up adjourning without taking up a whole lot of bills. So we have to take another stab at it this time. But, um, you know, I was fortunate to have the leadership in the Wisconsin assembly. They all understood it. And our speaker, you know, he understood it too. It's like, it's rare to have something that's such good policy, but also with such good politics. And again, when, you know, going into the election, when we real, we knew that suburban women were going to be a real weakness for us, it, it, it made all the sense in the world. So if they can build those kinds of coalitions and get their leadership to understand it, again, if they'll listen to it, you know, unless they have those, that just strong moral opposition to birth control, they're going to support it, I think. Yeah, right. There is, it seems like this, you know, like you said, a strong moral opposition, which you can't really do a lot of messaging or persuading around because that's just some, someone's deeply held moral beliefs. Are there any other um, oppositions that you found that um, you've had to encounter? So for example, I know we have heard sometimes from some uh, medical lobbying that uh, they don't believe pharmacists should be allowed to prescribe birth control, um, which seems is kind of at odds with what we've heard from the OBGYN community who says it's absolutely safe enough for pharmacists to prescribe birth control. If we're advocating for an over-the-counter pill, then why can't a pharmacist also you know, prescribe a birth control pill? So are, are there, are, is there strong uh, opposition in that regard or have you encountered that at all? I found very few in the medical field that opposed it, other than the, the Catholic physicians, they were opposed to it. They came in and, and had some very misleading testimony, to be honest. But um, all of the other medical groups, the AMA, the Wisconsin Medical Association, the, the, the family practitioners, the, the uh, American College of OBGYNs, and initially they were not in favor of this. They wanted it over the counter, but they didn't want pharmacy, 
pharmacy access, but if eventually they became pragmatic about it and realized this is a step towards that. And I think that's an important part of it too. If you're going to push this, get the medical community, talk to them. So I had, you know, uh, representatives from the medical community coming in and testifying and the, you know, the, the Catholic doctors were honestly one of our biggest opponents and they, they throw out all these things that are not at all accurate, you know, and so you need to have experts to come in and debunk that. Um, you know, they say, they would say things like, well, birth control is, is not effective. They, they cited a Canadian study that said like 60% of women that get pregnant are on birth control. But what they didn't say was that if you look at that study, they included like the rhythm method as one of their methods of birth control. So, um, you know, um, the birth control pill, when it's used properly, it's 99.9% .9 effective. So you, you need to get past all the, the garbage that they would throw out there. And that's where you need these experts to come in. But the medical community, I think, is, is very strongly behind it. So it sounds like what has been helpful for you in, in sort of getting this bill moving has been doing that sort of back end work where you're talking to the leadership and getting them on board. You're sort of building up, um, having people who are in the medical community to come and talk and feel empowered to talk about how that would impact their communities and the patients they serve. So, I, and I think that, I don't think that's just you. I think that's a trend across the country is that um, sort of having those people in your arsenal, so to speak, to, so they can be there when there is a hearing on a bill has been helpful. I've seen that as well. It seems that um, having that medical presence is huge to getting, uh, you know, the assembly members to sort of um, not run a little scared from the idea of having pharmacists prescribe. And I think that that's um, something that the medical community, I'd love to like be able to empower them more to do that. I know there are a lot of great people, especially in the pharmacy community that we work with who are speaking on this issue, who are working on this issue all the time. Um, and so it sounds like you're saying that leadership is really important to get on board sort of ahead of time and then also getting those medical professionals sort of in your field. Did you work at all with um, pharmacists in Wisconsin? Were they on board with this? Were they sort of neutral? I know we've run into some situations where they just don't really have the bandwidth to think about it in terms of the legislation part of it. So um, have you run into that at all or are people in the pharmacy community also really on board with this? Yeah, actually, in Wisconsin, the, the pharmacy community was very much on board with it. I should have mentioned that as well. And they came in and testified in favor of it. And actually, uh, representatives from the, the, the College of Pharmacy at the University of Wisconsin came in and testified in favor of it. So um, we did not, the only, again, the only opposition we had was the Catholic doctors and then the most extreme um, pro-life group. The, you know, Wisconsin Right to Life, which is more moderate, they, they stayed neutral on it. I think they actually supported it because I think if you, if you really analyze it, the extremists won't admit this either. But if you really look at it, there's no question that increased birth control access decreases abortions. Um, there, there's no question about that. The, the, the more extreme group, and actually, it's almost funny that the, 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 the woman that was representing the Catholic doctors, she actually said that that if you make birth control more available, then women go crazy and they start having sex in the back, back of cars and things like that. And then you have more abortions. She actually said that. So, um, so you know, that's the, I, I got off the subject a little bit, but I, I just, that came back to me. It, it's just, but um, now we had really strong support you know, across the board. And actually another interesting thing was, and one of the reasons I ended up getting involved in it when I did, my staff, when they first heard about it, they thought this was just a fantastic idea. And all of the young people in the Capitol, they, people were very enthused about this bill. It wasn't one that people were just like, oh, another bill, you know. And the, and the younger people, again, I think this is something from that political side, too, that, um, and, and that libertarian aspect of it. Younger Republicans really liked this bill. I was actually uh, just going to mention that as well. There is a survey done from Power to Decide a few years ago on young Republicans and their attitudes towards birth control. And it seems to me, similar to what you're saying, is that you're going to see a lot of younger Republicans who are taking on these issues. It's not just suburban women, it's just demographically younger Republicans consider birth control to be safe, effective, and should be more widely accessible. Um, do you think that these sort of changes in attitude are getting through to Republican lawmakers? Or do you think that 
this is something because I think these are these are already important to a lot of Republican lawmakers. I mean, obviously, I'm talking to you about it, right? This wasn't something that you were like, oh, all of a sudden I had need to get votes, so I'm going to do this this bill. So, do you think this is something that Republicans kind of have already as a priority, but there's just not been a lot of innovative reforms before something like a pharmacy access bill? It seems like this is such a good opportunity for Republicans to really show that they do care about health care and that they're doing it in a way that is uh, in line with conservative principles. So do you think that that's like already on their radar or do you think that a lot of younger Republicans are sort of um, shifting the attitude of the Republican Party? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's going to continue to evolve. I think that um, anybody that seriously looked at this last election and saw how, I mean, overall, this, turn, this election turned out much better for Republicans than was predicted. But nonetheless, we struggled. We lost two seats in areas in the suburbs of Milwaukee that traditionally were extremely conservative. Um, so it, it goes back to the thing with the suburban women. And I'm not sure that those lawmakers, all of them that are in office right now, have figured that out yet, why, why all of a sudden they're struggling. But I think that as the years go by and, and they are replaced, the new ones coming in are going to understand that or they won't get elected. Um, but, you know, some of those people, they're just pretty entrenched with, you know, they never had to appeal to moderates before. They, they only had to appeal to the most conservative um, element there. But I, I think that that is definitely changing. And um, again, this is just one of those issues that, that does appeal to the middle and to, the, and to women. And I think, you know, for younger people, I think they like seeing the Republicans do something that isn't so, that doesn't seem so out of touch, that's dealing with everyday issues that, you know, we're not, again, we're not just stuffy old men. We, we understand what real people are going through. And that's something too that I touched on in the beginning, but uh, I wanted to ask you about, it seems like, you know, we at our street, like I said, we're right of center and people are sometimes surprised to learn that we work on an issue like pharmacy access to birth control. But uh, to me as a right of center, person, this seems totally in line with the beliefs. And I think there's this attitude among some Republicans where they think that sort of acquiescing to some of these reforms means they're, you know, sort of wandering away from their conservative principles. But then I think a lot of, of uh, lawmakers like yourself are sort of saying, no, that's not, you're not abandoning your principles, you're acting on them, but it's just in these innovative ways. Do you think that's true? Or do you think that some people really do think they're sort of abandoning their platforms? No, it, it, definitely not. If you actually, again, if you actually look at what it what it's doing and, and how it relates to, you, you know, we're all about free markets. We're about removing government barriers from businesses. So it, it's just, you know, the government is not supposed to be involved in your everyday life. So I think absolutely, and I, you know, I'll be a little snobbish here, but I think the more cerebral Republicans that would actually think it through get that, you know, and that's what I ran into. The, again, the ones that were so entrenched um, and, and there were some that that actually thought that this would be a, that, oh, I, I, you know, I put something about this on Facebook and I heard from, you know, 50 people that said this is terrible. You're abandoning the Republican principles. They actually thought this would be unpopular. And it's like, you know, you know they would say, oh, in my district, you know, th this doesn't play very well. And I I would try to tell them, look, unless you're running for pope, this is a really popular issue in your in your district, you know. So, um there's that element that makes a lot of noise, but that is not the majority. This is not an unpopular issue anywhere. Yeah, that sounds about in line with, with what I've heard uh, elsewhere as well, which is interesting. So we did touch on COVID already, but as I mentioned, I kind of want to get back to it just because, I mean, what would a conversation in 2020 be without talking about COVID? So um, like we have seen... About what that would be like. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so we have seen some shifts, as I mentioned, in healthcare delivery in general because of the pandemic. As I said, governors have been issuing executive orders around pharmacists extending medication or prescription refills. Um, we've seen things like telehealth shoot up in terms of usage. A lot of people are using telehealth platforms. On the federal level, there's been a little bit of reform in terms of who can use telehealth platforms, which platforms you can use to talk to doctors. Um, all in the name of sort of getting people to healthcare access faster and more uh, efficiently and also less expensively. So I think that the question in everybody's mind is, and this is something that we have talked about a lot, but is this a rationale for maybe some of these regulations we didn't need in the first place? Yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to, 
to understand how some of this evolved, I guess. Um, you know, I think, as I said, though, before with COVID, I think that every profession is going to see things that they've done differently during the pandemic that they can bring those lessons forward, you know? And I think that in medicine, there, there are a lot of things like that. And actually, I hadn't really thought this through, but I'll use that as a selling point too when I bring it forward this time that, you know, now, especially when, when women have trouble getting in to see doctors and that kind of thing, it's, it's more urgent than ever. So, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure the evolution of, you know, I, I, well, I do understand a lot of it. I think, you know, when you go back to the 60s, when birth control first came out and it was, you know, it was, they weren't sure about it back then, you know, what the, what the, um, what the side effects would be. Um, so it made sense at that time for it to be prescription only. But when you, when you look at the, at, at it now, where it's like a 50th of the amount of hormone that is in the pill that, that was in it back then. And you just, the, the really, at this point, again, the safety is, is unquestioned. You wouldn't have all these medical groups supporting it being over the counter if there were really concerns about it. So, I mean, it's understandable how it started that way, but I, I, at this point, it's entirely become a moral issue. But I, um, but, but again, it is changing, and you see some strong conservatives that have come out, you know, in favor of even making it over the counter. Um, Senator Ted Cruz was, you know, advocating for it to be over the counter. Um, so it is, it's evolving. And I, I, I do think it's, it's going to happen. I would like Wisconsin to be at the forefront of it, whether that happens or not, I don't know, but, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's going to keep them, the momentum is there and it's going to keep moving forward, I believe. And I should mention really quickly to, uh, the people who are here, if you want to ask a question, feel free to put it in the Q and A box. Um, cause we'll get to questions in just a few minutes. Um, and we'd love to hear from you your thoughts and your questions for Representative Kitchens as well. Um, and I think, you know, you mentioned Ted Cruz as someone who supported over-the-counter birth control, you know, in the, uh, in Congress, we had a Republican-led bill to make it over-the-counter, basically saying that if you were a pharmaceutical company applying for an over-the-counter status for a birth control pill, that they would fast-track that process with the FDA, or they're urging the FDA to fast-track it, um, and they were also saying that we'll waive the fees associated with that fast-tracking. So you, you see some incentives in play, but the problem is that federal reform takes so long to happen. And so this is why we've really honed in on the state level reforms is because those don't tend to take as long to happen. And I think this is another conservative ideal is the idea that we don't necessarily need to wait on the federal government to take action to tell us how we live our lives. And so that's where I think state lawmakers are coming in and saying, we're going to change this ourselves, um, which is really important. Again, just speaking to the idea of federalism, uh, do you think that this is sort of on the cusp of, and we've talked about this a little bit already, but do you think there are going to be more, will this open the door for more types of reforms, as I said, with pharmacists, nurse practitioners, nurses, um, to perform more healthcare duties? And how does that play into um, expanding our bandwidth for healthcare? Because I know, um, for example, with physicians, there are the uh, annual report that comes out on physician burnout talks a lot about how adding pharmacists to teams can really help with some of that physician burnout. Um, and it allows, you know, as you said, them to take on some of these like lower risk issues and see patients at the pharmacy rather than scheduling uh, doctor's appointments. So did you hear any anything at all when you were working on this issue from that side of the medical community saying, yes, we want this because it's going to help us in the long run? Yeah, I think so. I think anybody, no matter your political affiliation, could say that our health care in, in this country is, is kind of a mess. You know, we, we spend more, far more than any other country in the world, and yet we have so many people that have trouble getting access. And because of the way the, the fee structure is, um, our primary care physicians are the ones that are paid the least. And that's, so that's where our shortages are. And again, there's so many of these things that, that can be done by by people who are not MDs. And I, I think that the more we can do that, and that's what, and I did hear that from the, from the OBGYNs and from the family practitioners that it, it would free them up to, you know, to work on, on things that are, you know, to spend their time on where they should be spending it basically. And also there's, you know, to be honest, you know, you would hear this from some people that, oh, but you know, th these doctors, they catch these things, you know, while they're doing this. I mean, I'm not a woman, but the reality is that when a woman 
goes in for a, a birth control prescription, typically it's just just going through the process and, and they're not, it's, you know, it's not really, um, they, they don't do that, that thorough, uh, um, you know, an exam and, and that kind of thing. Um, it is true though, that I think that OBGYNs and family practitioners do have to sell the importance of women going in regularly and getting checkups. They shouldn't be holding that hostage to, well, you can only, you know, you, we won't let you have your birth control prescription unless you do that. You know, they, I think they need to, to educate the public and, and um, on the importance of, of that, rather than again, just using this as a, as a gimmick sort of that, you know, to get women in the door, I guess. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Not holding it hostage, as you said, saying that you can't get your prescription unless you come in for, you know, a yearly checkup or whatever it is. We certainly want women to be able to do that. But I think that also speaks to just how difficult it is sometimes for women to get these appointments. If it's that difficult that, you know, they're not able to do it, that if it wasn't difficult, then this wouldn't be an issue, but it is. And so this is why we need some reforms like this. So um, I'll turn it. Go ahead. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to also say that, and it also is the reason that um, you know, the big majority of unplanned pregnancies are women in poverty and, you know, in, who are on Medicaid. So they don't feel, they don't have a relationship with a doctor. They don't go in for regular checkups. And that's why it is, is so important. I think, you know, nationally, two thirds of the unplanned pregnancies are women on Medicaid. So that's, again, goes back to that, that expense to taxpayers that we end up having to pay for that. And then because they don't have regular prenatal care and all of those kinds of things, the incidence of, you know, premature birth, premature births and all of these other complications is hugely increased in unplanned pregnancies compared to a, a planned pregnancy. So you have many more of them, the babies having to go into ne neonatal ICU, which is incredibly expensive and all those kinds of things that, um, you know, it really is a, it, it, again, it's young women in poverty that overwhelmingly are the ones that, that are having these unplanned pregnancies. Yeah, and I think those are also, I mean, the evidence is showing that those are exactly the, the people that pharmacists prescribing are reaching, which is what we want, right? So right. Um, we will turn real quickly over to some Q&A. Um, again, if you have a question or a thought, feel free to throw it in the Q&A. We'll get started here, but we have uh, about 15, 20 minutes to, to do this. So feel free to, to ask any questions. So uh, let's see, David Sobelson said, how about those who truly want to reduce the incidence of abortion in Wisconsin? This bill would do that. It's a true common ground approach to reducing abortion. It, was that something that um, really resonated with people in Wisconsin, do you think? You know, I, I think so. I think to, um, to the more reasonable, in my opinion, um, pro-life people, it, it was very much appealing. Um, in fact, one of the, they didn't come out and say this very much, but some of them view this as sort of a way to stick it to Planned Parenthood, because that is Planned Parenthood's bread and butter is, is, uh, is birth control. So um, it, to the more reasonable, though, pro-life people, I, I think that they appreciate it. But again, well, I'll go ahead. Pro-Life Wisconsin is a group that is, is pretty extreme. And they were the ones that, that really came in strong against me and, and threatened other legislators. There was a, a pro-life rally in the Capitol. And there was one guy holding a sign with my name, along with Governor Evers and, and Senator Baldwin, who are Democrats, saying baby butchers. Because so, I mean, so these are some fairly extreme people. But the majority of the reasonable Republicans, the reasonable people that are pro-life do understand that. Um, you know, I think when you look at the number of um, abortions over the last 20 years, it has continually declined. Yet the percentage of, of births that are unplanned has stayed the same. So what that's telling you is that it's because of increased access to birth control that abortions are going down. It's not because women are having less sex. So, um, you know, I think when you look at it, anybody that will look at this logically gets it. Um, the CDC said that, um, you know, increased access to birth control was, the, you know, a primary factor in reducing unplanned pregnancies. But yet there are those extremists, like I mentioned, the Catholic doctor, that say the, the more readily available you make birth control, the, the more women go crazy and, and, and get pregnant. So... Okay, we have a question from Caroline Kitchens who says, why is the morning after pill available over the counter, but regular birth control is not? And that is a great question. <laughs> yeah, um, no, 
Yeah. And it goes back. It's the same drug. Uh, I've forgotten how many times greater the dosage is. It's massively greater, but it is the same drug. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's a good point. There were, um, she's a smart girl, I know, but, um, but uh, that, you, you know, that's something we should have brought up as well. That just shows the hypocrisy of this, of, of claiming that this needs to be um, prescription only when you can get the morning after pill without a prescription. It's over the counter. And the fact that the rationale behind making emergency contraception over the counter was that this is an emergency situation. So you don't have time to go to a doctor, get a prescription for a morning after pill and then take it. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of us would argue, well, we don't want to have the emergency in the first place for people. So why not make birth control more accessible so that they're not having to use this method um, in, in an emergency? Um, so yeah, that's the, the regulation around the morning after pill and regular birth control doesn't make sense. It doesn't line up. Right. Yeah, definitely. And then Caroline says, does birth control really cause abortion? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is a question you probably got asked a lot during the 2019 session on this. So I'll let you take that away. <laughs> yeah. And that's one of the, that's, you know, the, the major point of opposition, um, from the, the, the really hardcore pro-life people, they, they claim that it is actually causing abortions. Um, and that's, there's absolutely no medical evidence that that is, that is happening. What it does is, is that it, it, it thickens the, the mucus in the cervix so that the sperm cannot enter into the uterus and it also prevents ovulation. Um, you know, and the, 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 uh, one of the well, one of the professors at the at University of Wisconsin Madison, whom I talked to about it. I mean, she pointed out that if it were really, if the method of action was really in preventing implantation of a viable embryo, which is what they claim, then you would see a lot of ectopic pregnancies in women on the pill because they would they would get pregnant, and a certain percentage of those would end up trying to implant in the in the oviduct, and you don't see that. So you know that's that's pretty strong evidence, but there is absolutely no medical evidence that modern birth control pills, that that is the method of action for them. Okay, we don't have any other questions in the queue right now. Um, oh, we do, just in time. Um, okay, so someone said paying for pharmacist time to do comprehensive consultation is imperative. It does increase costs to the states. Is this an issue? Are legislators willing to fight for paying for pharmacists' time? And this is an issue that uh, I talked about in the paper I mentioned, Lessons Learned, or Lessons for Legislators, is um, if a pharmacist is, uh, is providing these services, right? They're providing birth control consultations. An important incentive for them to provide that is that they can bill insurance for that consultation like a doctor would. Um, and so that's something that's really important to some of these measures, but we've seen is that sometimes you can't couple those issues together. It just won't make it across the finish line. Sometimes some states have passed, you know, the ability for pharmacists to prescribe birth control and then have a bill in the next session, let's say that allows pharmacists to bill for these services or be recognized as providers under insurance. Is that something that came up a lot uh, in the assembly? Because I, I think I recall some of that coming up when it came to insurance, but was it, did you have anyone sort of, um, yeah, and, and also as, they said under Medicaid, so under public health insurance programs as well. Is that something that came up uh, in the legislature with you? Um, it came up, it did come up a little bit. Um, but I think that, you, you know, the way our bill was set up, and I think a lot of states, is that the pharmacist would give the woman a questionnaire, and which she would fill out. And then if there were any red flags on there, you know, I mean, the primary um, bad side effect, I guess, would be blood clot, increased blood clot. So if there's any anything in there that raises a flag that this woman could potentially be at higher risk, then they would refer them to a physician. So other than just taking the blood pressure, um, there's not a lot of time involved on the pharmacist side. But, but I think that it is going to be important. But I think you're absolutely right from a strategic standpoint. It's, it would be better to get it, get it done and then go back and worry about that afterwards. I don't think it needs to be a huge amount. It's certainly going to be less expensive than going in and seeing an OBGYN anyway. Um, but, um, but, but in any case, um, yeah, it didn't come up that much, but that is an important element of it. They need to be compensated to some extent for that time, the extra time that they're going to have to spend. And at both, I mean, 
doing that also increases access because more pharmacists are incentivized to provide that service. And it also saves the state money in terms of, right, when nurse practitioners are more heavily involved, uh, basically, you know, consultations for nurse practitioners cost less than, say, a physician or OBGYN. Um, so it, it is that it, those are important things in having like the most effective pharmacy access model in a state. Um, but we, you know, insurance, this is what we've seen too, is that insurance companies often don't like the idea, um, which I'm not really clear on why, because it would seem that that would also save them money because it's a substitutable activity, right? A woman isn't going to her doctor to get a birth control prescription and then going the next day to a pharmacist and also having insurance pay for that same uh, that same uh, consultation. So if they're going to one, then they're not going to the other for the same thing. It would seem like that would overall increase or decrease the cost to the insurer. Did you did that come across at all from the insurance? Yeah, it did. And actually, you know, to be honest, when you first mentioned this, I would kind of it's it, forgotten. It's been, you know, it was early last year when we or yeah, when we were when we were working on it. So I'd kind of forgotten about that part. But actually, in our original bill, we did say that health insurance would cover a reasonable fee for that. But we ended up taking it out because of the health insurance lobbyists. And they it really infuriated me that they would take a stand on that because clearly it's cheaper than them going to an OBGYN for the same service. Um, so that is going to be an issue, but they're a powerful lobby. And again, we, you know, we just decided let's do this separately. We can go back and worry about that later but but yeah I, I really had kind of slipped my mind but that is an important aspect of it that the the insurance industry will fight that there um it, it makes no sense to me but but they will yeah okay we have another question does the wisconsin legislation allow people of all ages to access contraception from pharmacists yeah and that's a good question um ours was you had to be 18. now i would have been happy to not have that restriction, but there were a number of people in my caucus that would never have supported it if if you had said that you were taking um, you know the parents out of the decision. You know, to me, you know, these younger women under eighteen are are making the decision to to have sex, so it, it makes sense that you should allow them to have protection. It's not like this is gonna they're gonna engage in that activity just because because they can get a prescription. So I, I just, you know, to me, from a practical standpoint, I would have liked to have seen it go younger, but, um, but that would have been a killer for me. And that's one of the, you know, one of the legislative realities that we've, we've encountered as well is it's, we want a perfect bill, but sometimes, you know, with the lawmakers or, uh, you know, legislative staff say it's not part of the reality. It's, it's, it, I know it's frustrating for lawmakers who do want to add those things to bills. Um, do you think that's and something I, again? Yeah. I, I was going to I was going to add to that though that the College of OBGYNs actually they really wanted it to be under the age of eighteen as well. But uh, again, it comes back to to the reality. If you want to get it passed, you have to make some compromises, and that was one of them. Okay, uh, Paige Clark says we have such Medicaid payment in Oregon for pharmacist time prescribing birth control. This is a smooth and functional provision. It does seem that the states that have been able to get the insurance uh, part of it passed have had a pretty functional system. Oregon, though, to be fair, is sort of the, that's the gold standard for states allowing pharmacists to prescribe birth control. Um, and that's actually a great point is um, and something that is sort of making me think about what we need to dig into further is how to make that a smooth process um, because that's another thing that we want to work on is making sure we're providing as much information to people um, who work in state houses who are interested in this issue but want it to be as smooth as possible process because there are some states that have had a pretty rocky um, experience with this like maybe pharmacists aren't incentivized to prescribe or the regulations take so long to write that people are sort of in this limbo where they still can't go see a pharmacist um, and so that's and I, I've also seen some data out there, of course, on um, Oregon and Medicaid payments. Um, the uh, number of, of un unintended pregnancies was reduced with pharmacists prescribing. The uh, cost, or the yeah, the cost savings to the Medicaid uh, program in Oregon was somewhat significant. And so I hope that we see more of that as time goes on, because I think that sort of evidence. And actually, that's a good question that I want to throw in there for you is. How important is that evidence of this model actually working? Because I get a lot of questions about that. It's like, okay, this all sounds great, but does it actually work? How important is that evidence to legislators changing their minds on this? 
Yeah, you know, I don't know if it actually changes their mind, but I certainly used that evidence. Um, you know, Oregon is one of the few that has had it long enough where they can actually measure anything like that. So they did document or um, hypothesized about how many abortions were avoided because of this access. And, and also when you first do it, it takes a while to build up, you know, um, for women to get comfortable going to a pharmacist to get birth control and that kind of thing. Um, and, and especially when you're dealing with young women in poverty, for them to even know that they can do that. It, it takes a little while. So, uh, you know, that evidence is going to be hard to come by, but I think Oregon probably has the best evidence at this point that it, that it is working, that we're not having you know, women die of complications, and that we actually are preventing abortions um, and, and reducing Medicaid expenses. So um, I think as this picks up steam too, it's, that evidence is be, going to become more and more clear, and it'll make it an easier sell. Um, you know, I, I, it, to be honest, I mean, right now, obviously, it's easier to get this done in, in democratic states at the moment, because we, you know, we do have within my party, those, those social conservatives where it's a, it's a battle to get that done. Um, but in Oregon, of course, is, is very much a democratic state. So it was a little easier for them to, to, to get it done, but, but, you know, we can, we'll get it done too. Uh, and I think when you see some of the democratic states that have, or Republican states rather, that have passed it, it's very encouraging. And there's last question, which we've kind of touched on already, but is, is there any evidence that the pharmacy access model has been working in states that have adopted it so far? Yeah, again, um, Oregon has the best record, the, the most complete data. Most of the states, it's only been in, in place for a couple of years. And again, when it takes a while for it to even pick up steam and for people to use it regularly, it, it's pretty difficult to measure. But we certainly are not seeing um, big problems with it. Again, we're not seeing women, um, you know, having issues with blood clots and all those kinds of things that that would say, oh, you know, maybe we better slow down here. We're not seeing any of that kind of evidence. So, um, you know, I, I have no doubt that 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 is going to be there as we as it becomes more and more prevalent. So then we'll finish off with one last question. I kind of asked this already, but um, as Paige says in the Q&A as well, their bill in Oregon was proposed and passed by a Republican. Um, as someone who lives in Alabama, I will tell you that the Oregon Republicans are probably a little different than <laughs> Alabama Republicans. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's very encouraging to see some of this conservative movement, but we want, you know, more states uh, in like the Southeast, for example, to sort of take this on as a right of center issue. So if you were, you know, if you were speaking to, let's say, uh, leadership in your party in Wisconsin or in any state really of Republicans who are sort of considering their uh, roadmap for the next year in in getting Americans to realize that they care about healthcare access. What would you say? What would be your sort of uh, big push for for the pharmacy access model as why it should be on the forefront of the conservative uh, the conservative push for healthcare reform that deregulates some healthcare access, reduces costs, and increases access. Yeah, I, I think that the line of arguing I took with it is is first to lay out the financial cost of unplanned pregnancies, because with a lot of Republicans who are fiscally minded, that that resonates. And it's it's staggering how much money we spend. And again, that's just the measurables as far as the, you know, the, you know, what it costs to deliver the baby. That's staggering alone. But then again, when you look at the long term effects, it's it's unbelievable. But um, so I, I would hit them with that first and then go to the point about how there is no medical evidence that it needs to be a prescription. Um, you know, and I'm a veterinarian. There are only two reasons that a drug is supposed to be a prescription. First is that there's a abuse potential, which I don't think anybody's abusing birth control pills. And the second is that it, it has enough danger. And any drug has some danger. I mean, aspirin, ibuprofen, there's a, you know, there is some slight danger to it, but there is, it does not rise to the threshold. It's no more dangerous than ibuprofen. So, you know, you, you explain that to them, how those are the only two reasons a drug should be prescription only, and it does not meet either of those. So, and then you go to the argument about why this is a conservative issue, about how we're, we're the party that's in favor of, of free markets and about having minimal government and, and how the government should not be, you know, intervening in your life. So, you know, I, I think when you lay out those arguments, if you can do that in a logical manner, um, you know, again, unless they just had such strong moral beliefs against birth control, I think 
anybody else would be won over by those arguments. Well, thank you so much, Representative Kitchens. It's a thank pleasure you. to talk with you and to hear your insight. Um, for anyone watching, if you have any questions, uh, you can go to our street's website and find my information to email me. Um, we're happy to talk about any of these issues and we really appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule to chat with us about this. So thank you. Sure. Again. And I would say to people out there, if there are legislators considering this, um, our street is a great resource for this. And, and you guys, you know, you sent people out there to testify in our hearings and, you know, you were very effective in, in debunking some of the, the, you know, they, they, they just try to come up with so many arguments, even though it just comes down to they're morally opposed to birth control. So they come up with all the other arguments that they make them up. But you guys were, were really effective at that. And I would, I would certainly encourage anybody that's looking at this to contact you guys. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time again. Um, and I will let you all go. Thank you.